Our interview this morning is with uh, Frederick Rick Davis, who was born in Carbondale, Illinois in March of 1939. Rick served in the Army National Guard and then the United States Air Force from March of 1957 until March of 1986. His highest rank attained was 05 Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, this interview is conducted at Burleson, Texas on Friday, August the 3rd, 2012. My name is Dale Dexheimer. I'm not related to uh, Rick Davis in any way. Also in the room we have Milton Gibson, who is our videographer. This interview is conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress and also for Operation Remember, Burleson, Texas. And with that little introduction, Rick, you can tell us about your time in the U.S. military, sir. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, I, was, I originally went into the military in the Army National Guard in, El in Illinois. And the reason I went into the Army National Guard was I was a junior in high school and I had a friend who had just graduated the year before who went in and he was telling me how much fun they were having. <laughs> so I got permission from my dad who had to sign for me to do this and I entered the uh, National Guard. I served with the National Guard throughout high school. At the end of high school I had to go uh, active duty for six months. That was part of the commitment. I had to go Army active duty. So uh, I went to Fort Leonard Woods through basic training there. And, uh, and then I moved on to another assignment. And my next assignment was very interesting. I was the uh, driver for the company commander who was a African-American captain, sharp dude. And uh, while I was, I had about, four about three months left before I was gonna return and I planned on going back and working uh, like my dad did as a laborer, et cetera, or whatever that, I didn't plan on going to college. I didn't have the money. My folks were very poor. And I figured, well, I'm just not going to be able to do all that. I'll just have to go back home and do my normal thing. Well, this captain had a different idea. One day he approaches me about two months before I'm ready to get it, to return home. And he says, Special, I was a specialist with then, Specialist Davis, tomorrow they're giving some tests over in the gymnasium for people who do quite well. They're going to then send them to college for four years and support them. I said, college, I, I can't go to college, I don't have any money. And I told him, he says, I'll tell you what, specialist, you will go over there and take those tests tomorrow, or I'll take you out on the parade ground and I'll kick your butt the rest of the day. Now, which do you want to do? <laughs> so uh, I said, that sounds like a great idea to me. <laughs> and so I did, the next day I went over, the, and it was all eight hours of testing. I mean, they gave us a little bit of everything. And I just forgot about it after that day, I never thought any more about it. And about about three weeks prior to me getting ready to return to uh, my guard unit back in Carbondale, uh, the captain calls me into his office. And he says, specialist, remember those testing you took? You did quite well. You're one of the top 10%. And if you so choose, you can go to college for four years and the military will pay your way. The key word there is military. Because I had, had a commitment after that four years I had to go back, I had to go into the military, but I could go into any branch I wanted. And so I, uh, I accepted and did all that. I went back home, I went to Carbondale, uh, Southern Illinois University, Salukis, for four years. Okay. That's where I graduated from. And of course, the end of graduation, about six months prior, call, all this time I'm still in the Guard. And I'm getting ready to get out of the Guard, but I had to then go back in the military. And at that time I had to make a determination, and I decided, hey, I'd never flown in an airplane. My folks didn't, <laughs> I didn't know anything about flying. But it looked like fun. <laughs> so uh, basically I knew that I wanted to go back in the Air Force because I'd seen what the Army had to offer and it was pretty, I didn't particularly want to go that route. And after graduating, I went, uh, I went through officer's training down in Lackland Air Force Base. Got my commission. But I couldn't get in pilot training right away. Uh, in fact, they wouldn't even let me take a test for it. So I was quite disappointed. Uh, but, but they decided that they're gonna send me to officer's mess school. This is a, where you learned how to run an officer's club. 
And so they sent me off to Virginia, and I went back in the Army for almost three months to learn how to be a mess secretary. That's, they had the, the school for doing this. I got out, and I got my next assignment, Syracuse, New York, uh, up there at running the officers club. And I did that in about two years, and while I was there, I still was pressing to, to be allowed to take the examinations for uh, flying. And uh, finally, they relented and let me go off and take the test. You had to take a test for flying and test it for, for navigator. I did real well on the flying test and failed the navigator test. They said, you're never going to be a good navigator, <laughs> but you can fly maybe. <laughs> so uh, they offered it. They said they'd let me go to, uh, to officer train, er, flying school. But before I could do that, they said, we got a little assignment for you before we're going to release you because you're not 27 and a half yet. The latest you could go into, into flying was 27 and a half, and I had a, about 14 months before I was that old. They sent me to Iceland, Keflavik, for a year running the officers club up there. That was a very interesting assignment. I enjoyed it. Uh, in fact, the, about two days before I arrived there, the officers club burned down. I arrived there with no officers club with a commander of the, of the base who wants an officer's club. So my first assignment was to find buildings on the base in which we could renovate and make an officer's Because you've got to have some place where there's nothing else to do. Because it was dark. When I got there, it was dark 24 hours a day. And that gets very depressing. So you had to have somewhere to liven things up. So I got involved in uh, developing the officer's club. I even got a trip to Europe. I got to go into um, uh, Stockholm, Denmark. I had to go to Denmark. I'm shopping for furniture. I bought all this furniture over in Europe, had it shipped back. I'd never done any of this before, but man, you know, you're a second lieutenant in the Air Force, you should be able to do this, right? <laughs> and so I, I bought all this furniture, I, and I get it all shipped back, and uh, within about, oh, I'd say about six months after I, I got there, we had an officer's club. And then, of course, you got to fill it with entertainment. They always had live entertainment from Europe. I got another trip back to Europe. Got to go and meet some of these uh, agents that have their people that uh, that determine uh, who they have so many groups working for them. And I got to go to the various clubs and listen to these groups. And I I hired over a two years worth of entertainment for the club. They'd come in for a month. We'd fly them in there, the whole works from Europe. They'd entertain for a month. Go back, another group would come in. So that was very interesting. And of course, uh, all this time I'm waiting to go back to pilot training. And I finally get a notification that uh, I'm cleared for pilot training, training, and off I go to Advanced Air Force Base. And that's where I got my wings, Advanced Air Force Base. I qu qualified number two in my class, was able to get a fighter. Initially, I didn't want a fighter because I was thinking, you know, by now I'm thinking a few dollars. Hey, if I fly the big trash haulers for a while, I can get out and go with the airlines and make some real good money. But I had, once again, I had a African-American captain who was my instructor there. And uh, we're discussing about a month before we determine our assignment what we're going to do. And I said, well, I'm thinking about uh, C-141s. He looked across the table and he says, but then I, w I was a captain because I'd been in there. He says, Captain, you're not going to do that. You're too good a pilot. And I do not believe you would be very happy with that. I highly recommend you put in for one of the fighters. So I thought about it a little bit. And he kept telling me stories because he had done this. And I said, well, that's not like fun. I'll, I'll give it a try. So that's what I did for the next 22 years. I flew fighters. F-100s. Uh, I went to Luke Air Force Base. I, I hadn't been there very long. And I got assignment to Vietnam. And I went to Vietnam for a year. Flew F-100s over there. Had 240 missions. Out of that 240, uh, 238 of them I landed. Two of them I did not land. I got uh, shot down a couple of times. Got out of the airplane safely. Uh, both of them were pretty interesting pickups. Uh, the first one, uh, I actually got hit on a bomb pass. It was the SU-23. Blew a huge w hole in my left wing, and I was on fire instantly. And it was jump out right there. It was a very interesting jump out because where I was dropping this ordinance, we had a firefight going on one side, our guys and the bad guys on the other side, and I'm right in the middle of them coming down in a parachute. 
and I saw tracers all around me. The Lord was with me. I never got hit or anything. I hit the ground. I hadn't been on the, where I hit the ground was rice paddies. And you know the canals and the rice paddies? I happened to land in one of those little canals right between, and the mud, mud was probably three or four feet deep. And I just sunk into those with my, all this gear. I had about 80 pounds worth of gear on me. And my weight on top of it, I just sunk right in, pretty well up to here. And water and mud and the whole works. And by that time though, I saw helicopters heading my way. I knew they were trying to come to rescue because they were beeping a whirl and my body and the airplane went off when I ejected. And uh, <clears throat> I'm, what I really remember at that moment is the fact that I tried to pull myself out of that mud because I knew I had to get out of there and get up on the bank for them to get, I couldn't get my feet out. And I had all these combat boots on and all that, I'd sunk down, it's like a suction cup. I mean, I was just there, I tried everything I could to get out of that mud. And I, basically, finally, I just said, I gotta get out and get those boots off. We all had our boots with zippers on the side. So I literally went in, pulled the mud, got under the water, pulled the mud on one boot, zipped as much as I could, did raise back up, breathe back down. This probably took me two or three minutes. I finally got out of those boots. So to this day, there's probably a pair of combat boots stuck in the mud there between those canals. But anyway, uh, I crawl out. By that time, the helicopter is coming. I mean, they're in there and they're firing their little guns at the bad guys. And I'm crawling. I crawled about maybe 20 yards flat on my stomach as I could get to the helicopter. And I remember one of the guys around the helicopter, he pulled me just like this, literally lifted me. It must have been the strongest dude in the world. He lifted me and threw me in that helicopter and we took off. And next word I heard is, Sir, we're so glad to rescue you today. This means three days of R&R &R for us. We're going to get to party. <laughs> and, and so they were very happy to pick me up because they were going to get to party. And uh, that was very interesting. The second time, once again, I got shot up pretty badly, but I tried to make it home. And part of our home was right up the coastline of the China Sea. And finally, uh, my airplane just quit on me. Hydraulics were shot, the whole work. The airplane just stopped. I did a control bailout at about 8,000 feet, and I ended up falling into the water of the China Sea, and I was about a mile and a half offshore where I went down. When I went down, in this area over here, we have a flotation of Vietnamese fishing boats. There was probably 12 or 13 of them over here fishing. Of course, I didn't see them until, because I, I got knocked out on this one. If something happened, I physically got knocked out on the ejection. I woke up in the water, had my, and I deploy, everything's automatic on your deployment except for one thing, that's your water wings that goes on your wing. Some way they got deployed. I don't remember ever doing it. Because I, I woke up basically in the water. And by this time, of course, these boats are all heading over my way. And one uh, older gentleman and two young boys in their boat, fishing boat, got to me the soonest. What am I going to do that? I'm sitting there in the water. All I got is a 45 on me. <laughs> I don't know whether they're good guys or bad guys, but they wanted me to come ashore, uh, come into the boat. Well, I did get into the boat. They never bothered me or anything. I uh, had my, all still my gear. They never took the gun or anything. And of course, I'm looking around and notice about three miles offshore, there's a destroyer. John Hancock sitting out here. And you can see it from our boat. And I kept trying to get this gentleman to turn and take me to that boat, because I don't want to go ashore. You don't know what's on shore. In fact, I don't know what I've got right here right now. They, um, but he kept heading to shore. Well, once again, when you bail out, all those bo all those sounds go off, and everybody in the world knows that you've jumped out. So, but then I had helicopters coming after me again. We get about within a half mile or so of the shore, and right over the head, two Huey helicopters, right here, fully loaded with guns, and they they come over. These other boats are trying to get to us too. They opened up between us and the other boats. And they just did an about face. This man here, who I've been trying to get to turn and go to, to the, he did it too. And he, he knew what I wanted. <laughs> and he started, and by then, the John Ancott dropped their boat over the side, met the two of us. We did an exchange right there. I spent the night on the John Hancock and then back to Fan Rang the next day. Um, what come to find out, this gentleman and, the, and his two boys, they issued over there a chit called, and it looked like a little flag, gold. $10,000 worth of gold if anybody with the, one of those chits saved a pilot, rescued him. 
So he lived for many years on that $10,000, I guarantee you. And that probably, uh, once again, I was very fortunate. The Lord was on my side during all that. Well, I finished my combat tour and uh, uh, got upgraded, told I was going to go to F-4s. And uh, went off to my F-4 training, flew F-4s. Had 5,000 hours in F-4s, never had to jump out of one of those. So all that was good, and I was all over the world flying F-4s. Homestead uh, was where I got my training, Homestead Air Force Base. And uh, I was able to go to the Wider Weapons School and do all the good things that uh, it's on there too. It's on my on that thing over here anyway, Wider Weapons School. And uh, that was interesting. I enjoyed that time. Um, the rest of the time was pretty dull compared to the Vietnam era. It was just a lot of good flying all over the world, flying with some good people. Flying, uh, you meet some of the most interesting people in that, both ground troops and aviators. And it's, it's a very close-knit group. It's a, it's a family group, especially a squadron. Probably the closest of any time in my life has been the times in the squadrons. Families, you did everything together. And it, it, it's like a very small community. And you never, you don't see any of that in civilian life. I've never run across that, that same camaraderie that you have in a fighter squadron or any squadron. It, people are protecting your back. You know at all times you've got 20 guys that will do anything for you because you depend on one another when you get airborne as to how well I'll protect your back, I'll protect your wing. It's, it's, a, it's a group thing. It's a team thing. Uh, it's like a good football team. Uh, good football team. You gotta have a good quarterback, you gotta have good alignment, you gotta have the whole works if you're gonna have a good fighter squadron. <clears throat> and um, got out in 86 and then went, went to work built, or making sure that F-16s and now F-35s and F-22s are all built correctly. I'm a Lockheed Martin uh, quality engineer and I make sure all the planning is good for that. That's what I've been doing for the last 25 years since I got out. So I've had two good careers, one in the Air Force and one with Lockheed. That's about all I have to say. Quite a story. <clears throat> yeah. uh, you were a driver, Army National Guard, when you went and did your six months, you were mm -hmm. a driver, a driver for the, for the company, company, company commander. Company commander, squadron commander. Who happened to be Afri African American? African -American. Two African Americans have been a difference in where I've gone in my career. You said sharp dude. Very sharp individual. I mean, he he had it all together. He was a uh, he was probably uh, well, he was the first man that taught me that pride in your uniform. You never saw him not being top notch in any way he dressed. Career or, army. Career army. Uh, he was. Uh, I thought a great leader. Uh, all the men in this, in there, in it, they just loved him. I guess the thing I get out of that, Rick, when I think about it, if he had that impression on you, you think what he did with thousands of other guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Milton and I, like I say, we've interviewed quite a few folks, and the people that impress me most are those that really took care of their troops. Oh, you better be they, yes. be they enlisted yeah. or officer, those that worried about the guys they were responsible for. Exactly, exactly. So and he was difference. number one at that. And the gentleman I told you about in pilot training, the African-American, my instructor, he was just, he was, he was known as the, he got top instructor several times. Uh, and he just, he laid on the line and he didn't pull any punches and you always felt very comfortable around him. And that's important when you're flying. When you, uh, when you made the determination to go in the Air Force, uh, fun to fly, but even after you got that first gold bar, you couldn't fly. They just didn't no. have the, just they didn't, didn't have, have the slots. slots. They, didn't, they, they, didn't have, they didn't have a spot for me. Matter, told, matter of dollars? Dollars. They said, they said, though, eventually, we're going to get you to pilot training. 
because I, I still had a little over two and a half years before I was 27 and a half. And that was the cutoff point. You couldn't go to poly training after 27 and a half. Okay. And so we get, said, we got a great assignment for you. We're going to send you to Keplovic, Iceland. Well, you did a little bit of O Club time in Syracuse first. I don't, are there that many, was there an army base in uh, upstate New York? At no, the time? It, it was strictly a, a, a air, air command, uh, okay. ATC or whatever, okay. air command. I can't remember the terminology. You were a logistics guy. Yeah, uh, uh, they were uh, the gentlemen that protected the country, you know, those type of flyers. And they had some, they had some planes there too. But primarily helicopters. When you take the test, you pass the flying part. <laughs> fail the You fail the navigation. I don't know what I failed on it, but the uh, navigation part was a lot more complicated, a lot more math, uh, a lot of weather, a lot of weather type questions. Uh, whereas the flying part was more, uh, I think, a mental test to see how would you react in this situation. What was there any prep for these tests? Did they? You nope. just take you in there one take day and sit you down, and here you, you go. Here's, you take the, took the flying in the morning, navigator in the afternoon. That may be one of the reasons I failed the navigator. I was so hepped up back to the morning. By the time I got to the afternoon, I was pretty well. This would have been, uh, uh, let's see, time-wise, 63, 65. Are there still navigators today, per se, in the Air Force? Oh, uh, no, there are weapon systems. Yeah, there is on the big airplanes, but not in fighters. Uh, fighters and Army are weapon systems officers, which are our equivalent as ba a navigator. The backseater. The backseater, weapon okay. systems officer, right. They don't have them in the fighters, but they do have a lot of navigators still in the, uh, on the big player airplanes. I guess that, I think of a navigator, of course I was Navy, but I, I, I remember guys shooting stars and what have you, and I wouldn't think that Air Force does that anymore. Oh, I don't know whether they do that anymore, but they do have uh, navigators, I know, on some of the crews, the big airplanes. Um, but I definitely had them back then, a lot of them. Uh, moving on beyond that, you're married now, or yes. were? You uh, are now? Yes. Were you married when you were in the service? Where? I was married in, uh, while I was in the service, yes. Uh, Where'd that come along? Okay, my first marriage was prior to ever going in there. I was in the, in, still in college and I got married. Uh, that didn't last very long. Uh, she knew where I was going, she didn't want to leave town. <laughs> what it amounted to. Yeah. And so I went off, and then five years later, I met the lady that had my two children that I have. And we were married at, while I was in Vietnam in the whole war. Uh, I got back from Vietnam. She was not real happy with the military by then because I was gone a lot. She wanted me to get out. I loved the military. I said, hey, I'm supporting us well. We're living good. What's the problem? She said, I want to go back to Cincinnati, Ohio. I met her at a wedding uh, when we first got married. So she gone. And I've been with this lady for 17 years, what I'm married to now. Uh, when, you, when you got your degree, what did you get your degree in? Economics. Air Force paid for your degree in economics. Not the Air Force, the military. Uh, yes, that's right. You did make that distinction. Yeah, yes, it sir. was not yeah. the Air Force. It, okay. it was. Yeah, they paid a full four years. And that was your choice. The My econ choice. was. The what? The economics was yeah. your choice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you have in mind there? Uh, I just wanted to graduate because I knew I was going to go back. I was going to be able to hopefully get in the Air Force. Okay. I just find a way to get a degree in four years, and and I was always good in that era, uh, and so that's what I went in and got my major in. That and uh, accounting, it was it was an economic slash accounting. Uh, you went to Iceland, and I guess it was the base commander that wanted a nice new O club. Yep, base commander. He would have been full. He was a full colonel. Full colonel. And, and I was spoke, a first lieutenant with him. Spoke with authority. Spoke very much with. In fact, he, I'm going to have a golfer, okay? And while I was still at Syracuse, I went to outside of Detroit. I can't remember the where it was or what, even the 
the golf course or whatever, but a ADC, that's what Syracuse was, the ADC, Air Defense Command, okay, just came to me, Air Defense Command. I uh, qualified, the top three in that big tournament, it was all ADC, got to go with the Dean Crosby as in playing the Pro-Am. I was number four, okay. Well, this going to Iceland was a real smack for you, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I, I didn't make the top three, but I was number four. I get to Iceland, okay, and uh, one of the guys, something happened that he couldn't make it. So they contacted me, ADC Command, and said, you're, the slot is open if you can get away to play in the tournament in California. I go to the base commander, and, because man, I, I was I was hip. I was gonna fly out there. I was gonna get because we had come through there. Sir, uh, SAS, SAS Airlines. That was one of the stop points. They spent their nights there, so that was good for troops. A lot of pretty young ladies in the officers club, and I'd been a direct flight right to right into L.A. right with them, and I already had that set up, greased. And I went to him, told him my story, and he says he looks at me right, and he says, Lieutenant, what have I got you doing right now? Well, sir, you got me. Developing a, a new O club. What do you think is more important? You go play golf, or you make sure I get a good officers club. <laughs> and I could be a little stubborn at times. And I said, "Well, sir, I think I can do both." <laughs> he didn't like that answer. He said, "I don't think you can, Lieutenant. <laughs> and you're not going to that tournament, so forget about it. You're going to Europe in about two weeks, and I expect you to be over there and get this done." So we dropped it. I never got to play in the tournament. <laughs> yeah, he, he was very, he was, he was fair though. Man, I had a few drinks with him in the officer club at the time. He was a nice man. But he knew what he wanted. <clears throat> After you buy the furniture, et cetera, you go back to Europe and you recruit this talent. Yes, for, for the, the officer's club. club. I did right. it for a two year period. I, I had to get it for the next two years. And what it, I, I had agents taking me to where their groups were entertaining and doing. And they wind and dine me. I got taken care of real quick. They all wanted their group to be one because they paid them very well. Did did you ever have a group that Milton and I maybe would recognize the name? No, no. It was just never any national group. They were just entertainment dancers, uh, uh, musicians uh, that would be with the dancers. You even had some magicians, a little bit of everything, but nothing of national. I don't remember being national. They may have later on, because most of the groups were pretty young. Who knows, they may have later on, but they were all European, and I don't, I don't know of any. But it was yeah. interesting, it was a very interesting time. <clears throat> uh, go to Vietnam as an F-100. F-100. Super Saber, I think Super they called them. 280 mission. Well, 240. 240. Two, oh, 240, I'm sorry. And I landed 238. Yeah, okay. At least, I brought, at least I brought two air, uh, 238 airplanes back home. <laughs> That's a lot of missions, though. Yeah. In, it, well, in, in what time frame? 13 months. 13 months. Yep. Flew just about every day, sometimes twice a day. When, when you got shot down, um, I'm sorry, you said, I think you said what, what they shot you down with. ZSU-23. That's uh, a missile? No, it's a, it's a pod-mounted four-barrel gun. Okay. And believe it or not, lots of times, the guy firing that gun is chained to the gun. 37 millimeter, 57 millimeter? ZSU 23. 23 millimeter? Okay. Yep. But four. Four pods. Putting a lot of stuff up Putting there. Putting a lot of stuff out. Okay. Yep. When you ejected, you go into the mud, does... You go out of the seat, you and the seat go out of the plane mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. and then you separate? Separate, yep. I went, I went out at probably about 2,000 feet, because I just, right here when I got hit, uh, pickled about 1,000 feet because the bomb tied bombs were, and I got hit right there. I pulled it up, got it going up, and ejected, because I had fire all around me. Uh, yes, we separate the seats, separate. Okay, so. Automatic. So the, the fact your boots are still over there somewhere, but it was just you. Now, the, the chute did open, right? Oh, yeah, the chute opened. It, it opened probably about 500 feet above the ground. 
So whatever your velocity was. I wasn't, wasn't doing the full 32 seconds right. or whatever. No, but I had so much weight on me. I had, like I said, about all kinds of gear on it. We wore, we wore you name it, we had it on us. Radios, water, uh, guns, uh, you name it, on us. Some guys carried two guns. I don't know what the, what that accomplished because I don't think they'd ever been able to use them. But, uh, uh, trying to think of something else on, on, on your, uh, do you get a Purple Heart out of? Two, out of the ejection. Out of both ejections. Both ejections. I got tore up here. Just, I just got, the fact of, of uh, I guess it was an explosive shell under the seat that sent you up. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It, like a cannon shell. Yeah, it, th it throws about 12 G's on your body. Okay. Makes you. That's. Did you, did you catch something on the canopy when you went out or? No, no. We don't. They don't know what it was, but I was bleeding internally one time. I got. They got me. And I, I was sick. I couldn't hear it, and I'd busted something inside. And they went in. Prepared. The reason the reason I ask we we've heard some of these stories before and and I think a lot of guys got some kind of injury on the ejection. Oh yeah. Well, if you're not in the perfect position or the airplane's not perfectly level, if you go out in an awkward position, you can break your back. <laughs> you can uh, break arms real easy. They get flailing around. Uh, but smart man, uh, see, they had two ways in the LWF 400. You could pull over here, or you could pull between your feet. The smart move was to pull between your feet because that brought everything right in here. But if you went out here and pulled them, you could get hurt. And a lot of guys learned that and they never, they never ejected with the side ejections. F-100 was a one person? You one were the person. only guy in it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the uh, interesting, the, the, the second time, the at sea, the gold chit. Oh, yes. Yes, that was uh, that was a, a common thing, or that, that they carried them. The good Vietnamese, they were issued to quote the good Vietnamese, because it, and they knew it was a, they were always looking for a way to earn that shit. And the U.S. government issued them gold. That's what I was told. That's all I I didn't see okay. the gold. They didn't they didn't take Yankee dollars. No, or, no, 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 no. They wanted the real they thing. Wanted, put it in your teeth. They can bite on. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Wow. Yep. Did you, uh, could you communicate with, with, with this old guy in the boat? No, he didn't. Other than? Hand signal, and he knew no English. Uh, and, English and at all. You did. But he knew, because I'm pointing at, I want to go there. A <laughs> hand signal was alone. He knew I wore I went, And he knew as soon as that helicopter came over, he says, I better not go to shore. So he turned and went back out, and they met me, picked me up. Do you spend any time with the Vietnamese people at all when you were when you were in country, Rick? Oh yeah, on base. You know, we had a lot of worked on base. We had several worked in our own hooch in our own building where we lived, and uh, they were nice people. You lived in a barracks. Uh huh. Also Sand, barracks. Sandbagged. Yes, we had. In fact, we had sandbags right outside the entrance. Of, where that's where you'd go if there's any mortars coming in. Interesting story while I was there, if you want to hear this, <laughs> if you got time. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. We were constantly being bombarded from, you know, shells lobbed in or this kind of thing. They'd, overnight, they'd get out there and they'd throw some stuff, crap in on us. But we had people, we had rocks. You know what rocks are? Uh, the Koreans, they're called rocks. Okay. They were our perimeter guard. Some of the meanest military men in the world are rocks. And they loved to catch the Vietnamese in the wrong place. Well, I remember this one night where they all these lobbed in on us, and we're all in our barracks. We wake up the next morning, and uh, there's a lot of activity going on. Come find out, they killed 15 that night. They were trying to get into the perimeter. They captured two. They took the 15 and laid them at the entranceway onto the base. So everybody that came, because the workers who worked there went home at night, came back the next morning. And we know for a fact that many of them were sympathizers with the other side. In fact, a few of them got caught measuring distances off, how far it is from this point here to this hooch. And we know what they were doing. They were giving that information to people that wanted to attack or throw ordnance in here and try to hit the target. 
But they laid the 15 out just to let those people know this is what happened to you. Well, the two that they captured, they were trying to get a lot of information out of them, and they were mean. So, and to this day, I can remember the helicopter taking off with those two guys in it. They took it up over the base, to about 1,000 feet, sailed to, and pushed one of them out. They got all the information they wanted from the other one. Our command never said one word to them. That was okay. But that happened a lot over there. Those rocks, you didn't mess with them. We were the good guys. Yes. Uh, let's see here. 5,000 hours in F-4s. Yeah. Bunch of good people. What's the best duty you think you ever had? Duty station. Tour home in Madrid. Okay. Four years. Fantastic and flying, fantastic country, fantastic people. Uh, have the wife with you? Oh, yes. That's a beautiful, that was the second wife, the one I had the two children with. Right. Uh, yeah, that was a great So summer. you got to travel Iberian Peninsula and maybe France? Oh, yeah. We got up into France. Or we, we got up into England. In fact, I got to go all over that part of the world because we were constantly flying out to support people, exercises and that. Or if I wanted to, take a cross country, you know, F4, throw some couple of pods underneath. Amazing what you can get in those pods. You can get, you can get uh, golf clubs and everything in there. <laughs> but it was a training mission. Get from point A to point B. Maybe have a little navigation. Yeah, have there. a little navigation in there, yeah. Uh, Worst duty, I would think Vietnam would, would, obviously people shooting at you is not a lot of fun, but. I don't claim any of them as bad duty. I never had an assignment I didn't get something out of. Uh, well, you'd have to say Vietnam because you you could get killed, you know, so I'd have to. I didn't have any bad, I never had any bad assignments. I had some better assignments, but I never had any, what I'd call bad assignments. I can't answer that question. Uh, just a couple quickies here. Uh, F-100, which was a, I suppose, a late 50s, really. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, 56, 55, somewhere in there when it first came along. Okay. Right after the 86s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some characteristics maybe of that airplane, Rick. Very unforgiving airplane. You get it in the wrong position at the wrong time, you're going to die. Uh, you, d you didn't want to horse it around at the wrong time. It's very underpowered. Uh, you can kill yourself in the traffic pattern. The thing wanted, anytime you're going hard one way, it's wanting to go the other way. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it, w it was a much more, uh, you had to really fly it truly fly it more so than I did the F-4. The F-4 was an amazing airplane. You, I never ever felt like I was un, in any stress at all with the F-4, no matter what I was doing. Now, F-4, you did have a backseater, didn't yes. you? Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. Uh, and the character, that's what was, the, and it was, it was just basically slow, you know? I mean, you could still go four or 500 mile an hour, but it didn't have it. it didn't accelerate wouldn't, well. Wouldn't go supersonic? No. Down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, It'd get to about 0.92, which is real close. It'd get around the bubble. And if you pushed it over, you could break it, you could break it down. But just to fly straight and level, no. And you are still, today, you're still employed, Lockheed yes, Martin? Lockheed Martin, yep. So you've, uh, starting in 1957, mm -hmm. good golly, that's uh, 50 plus years. Yep. Enjoyed it immensely. Don't plan on stopping either. Well, great. You bet. Yeah, I, I don't think retirement's that big deal. <laughs> I enjoy the people I work with, and it's a good challenge. And we're turning out the world's best airplanes. Milton and I are happy to hear that, sir. Yeah, we are. You bet. Rick, we appreciate you taking the time to, to come see us. Enjoy uh, it. Do the interview, and we certainly appreciate the time you've spent defending the nation, sir. Thank you. Appreciate your time too, gentlemen. You bet. Yes.